run for the next nine months and to include 150 industry leaders and representatives of government under the dynamic leadership of Mr. Praveen Patel, CEO CF, and the Organizing Committee Chairman, Dr. Prasad Khandigar. The Center for Industry Academy of Partnerships was started with the intention to build collaborations with industry and academia to leverage the maximum potential and impact outcomes. The step taken is in the direction to develop the innovative solutions through process-driven approach. It is my privilege to introduce Mr. Praveen Patel, CEO of the Center for Industry Academy of Partnerships, who has been a pioneer in developing it and taking this initiative ahead in bringing significant change within the university. Before starting with the session, I shall request my technical team to play the inaugural video of Encore. Becoming a global leader is a noble dream. What is our strength as India? It is knowledge. The strength of a nation in the digital age we find ourselves in is governed solely by its research and development index. The speed by which technology is accelerating has been unmatched since the dawn of humanity. India boasts of the largest manpower pool under the age of 30 in the world. Though we have potentially a gold mine of researchers with us, we barely produce any research. We have to import technology from nations like China. Our universities and our industry do not seem to share the deep connection that they do in countries like the US or China. That is why the IMC's Knowledge Committee, in association with MIT World Peace University, are hosting INTCOM, a revolutionary online conference between industry and academia. The way for India to become a global leader lies in its repository of knowledge. INTCOM is the way to do so. Thank you so much. The theme of this session is Opportunities and Challenges for Sustainable Research and Development Initiatives in India. Today we have the privilege to have amongst us Dr. Lalit S. Kanodia, Chairman, Datametics Group, Dr. A.P. Jairaman, Senior Nuclear Scientist, BARC Chairman, National Center for Science Communication and President of STEAM Academy, Ms. Nidhi Rana, CEO and founder, Kyun Shis. Mr. Sanjay Singh, CEO and MD, Genova. Before starting off with the session and handing it formally to the moderator of the session, I shall request the technical team to play the session video. There is an immense opportunity for the private sector to enhance its investments in the R&D sector in India as it provides a very diverse market for investments as compared to other countries. A large chunk of the total R&D spent is done by the government and there is a vacuum in private investment. For R&D to grow and sustain, many challenges such as the uncertainty, high degree of complexity, difficulty in framing clear expectations need to be addressed. Thank you so much. Please allow me to introduce you to the moderator of the session, Dr. Suman Devdulla, Head of School of Faculty of Designing. Before handing the session to Sir, I shall request all the participants to type your questions in the chat box that is provided, and all your questions shall be answered towards the end of the session. Over to you, Dr. Suman. Thank you, Professor uh, Chayonika, uh, for this uh, kind introduction. 
and I'm glad to see all the participants uh, in front of us. I regret to not have my video on when it is actually on. Uh, the fluctuations in my internet is not allowing my video to be put on. Am I clear, Professor Shainika? Before I go forward, I just want to do a small check. Yes, sir. Yeah, you're audible. Yeah. yeah, but I think your bandwidth is low, so it's showing that sign of low bandwidth. So perhaps yeah. that's a little bit. So uh, I'll just leave it to the fluctuations to allow my video to be put on as when it is uh, speed enough. So uh, welcome to the uh, day two of Incon 2020-21. Uh, organized by IFC Chamber of Commerce and Industry, uh, with the knowledge partner being MIT World Peace University. So I'm also glad to invite on the panel, uh, Ms. Nidhi Raina. Uh, Nidhi is the CEO of Quantius. Quantius is a platform for a better world, which comprises products, services, and experiences that support people and planet growth. Nidhi believes conscious thinking and living has the potential to change the world. Nidhi was earlier the global head for personal excellence and organizational development at TCS, working with CEOs to increase adoption of digital, of both technology business and human behavioral development. Uh, her department has won many awards for accelerated people and organizational transformation at scale. Now in the interest of uh, the other speakers, I would just want to give a small extended uh, introduction to the other distinguished speakers on this panel. So it is my privilege to welcome uh, Dr. A.P. Jairaman. Uh, he has been a nuclear scientist for 40 years over. He is currently the president of STEAM Academy. And uh, as you might be knowing, STEAM, rather than just standing for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, also has an art component. You'll be pleasantly surprised to see his communications in, term, in terms of the books, which are very much about science popularization as the uh, chairman of the National Center for Science Communication, uh, bringing science front forward to the general public, which is a very, very challenging task. And uh, he is also on the India Development Foundation as a trustee. He was a dean at uh, SICOMS. And he's also a teaching professor and research guide on supply chain and technology management. Otherwise, uh, uh, extensive experience in science and science communication. I'm glad uh, Dr. A.P. Uh, Jairaman uh, has consented to our invitation and is with us today. Uh, moving forward, it is my uh, privilege to be introducing Dr. Lalit uh, Surajmal Kanodia. Uh, Dr. Lanit Kanodia is the chairman of Datamatics Global Services Limited, which he founded in 1975. Dr. Kanodia is a founder CEO of TCS, Tata Consultancy Services. He has his PhD and MBA from MIT in USA. His mechanical engineering earlier from IIT Mumbai. He's a Ford Foundation Fellow. He received Distinguished Alumnus Award of IIT Mumbai. He's one of the 10 persons included in the Hall of Fame published by DataQuest, along with our Prime Minister, rather late Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi, and late Bharat Ratna, Dr. Jyadi Tata. He was awarded the Asia Specific Entrepreneurship Award for in 2015 for outstanding and exemplary achievements in entrepreneurship. Otherwise, he has served as the pres past president of uh, the Management Consultants Association of India and national president of Indo-American Chamber of Commerce. He has been a member of the executive committee of NASCOM, he was the president of IMC Chamber of Commerce and Industry 2017-18, which is the voice of over two lakh corporates, as everybody knows. And he's the director on a large uh, boards of companies. Uh, Dr. Kanodia was also on the executive board of MIT 29, uh, 2009 to 2016. So with this brief introduction of uh, our uh, distinguished panel members today, uh, I should also note that uh, Mr. Jayanta Deb, uh, who is extensively experienced in the industry, and is currently the CTO of MG Hector, is unable to join us. Uh, he might join any time, uh, and I'll do the honors uh, at a time when he joins later. Moving forward, uh, I'm sure uh, the material which has been shared with all the distinguished guests has put the context right. When we are discussing about opportunities and challenges for sustainable R&D initiatives in India. 
Now, before I even go forward in terms of uh, putting down what the challenges are, I would want to emphasize opportunities first. And opportunities, India has, in my opinion, a lot. So the context in which I want to discuss the opportunities is from this perspective. A while back, during the time of World War, there was a Wanawa Bush report, which the United States has commissioned as to how we need to be thriving in World War, and then what next? So Wanawa Bush has written an extensive report on how science and technology could be used for a world leadership. In a reaction to that report, we have Donald Stokes write about an, uh, uh, what is called as a pasture quadrant. His understanding or his motivation was to basically see what should motivate scientific and technological research. Should it be use inspired or should scientific research be for scientific research sake itself, research for research sake? Now I'm sure uh, the one and a half day of the conference has highlighted a lot of issues with respect to what the challenges could be in terms of India spending a lot less comparatively with respect to the other world nations, much smaller than itself also. But however, the pressures, as Dr. Mohan Rao has pointed out in the previous session, to be in a hurry in terms of academia, to publish an industry, to productize, should not actually undermine research for a knowledge economy. Now that's the context in which we would want to continue this session forward. Now, before I do that, I would like to mention or explain what I mean by pasture quadrant or what Donald Stokes meant by pasture quadrant. So pasture is after Louis Pasteur, and Louis Pasteur was also doing active research during the time of Second World War. However, his research was largely on pasteurization. I mean, the, word, the process was after his name, Louis Pasteur. So how would milk withstand uh, a longer shelf life? How can it be made available for a lot more people where it could be transported from the place it could be produced? Now this research, which is used inspired by Louis Pasteur was not similar to what Niels Bohr did. Niels Bohr did more fundamental research where the quest for fundamental understanding was very high and the consideration of use was immediately very low. So his research was pure, as we call it, pure basic research. However, its implications are huge, as we might understand, as Dr. A.P. Jairaman might also understand. The other quadrant is also called Edison quadrant, where it is called pure applied research. Now, the quest for fundamental understanding there is very low, but the considerations of use are very high. And we had a distinguished panelist yesterday, uh, Dr. Indu Shahani, who is also the chair of uh, ISDI in Mumbai, speak about how designers work hands-on, work a lot of trial and error, and then do one dish. Now, we are speaking about Edison, who has tried 10,000 times before he actually came up with the bulb. Now, are we in India in a situation where private corporations can experiment so much with their limited funding, particularly when government does 80% of uh, the research in India compared to 69 to 70% in the OECD countries. Now, what should motivate government funded research? What should motivate private funded research? Now, how should we sustain these R&D research uh, initiatives in India is largely the context of uh, this session. Now, moving forward, uh, as I said, uh, let's uh, focus more on opportunities while not neglecting challenges and challenges have been mentioned by different panel members earlier also. Now we want to look at opportunities in India from the geographic perspective, from the demographic perspective, from a democracy perspective. And I would like all our distinguished panel members to throw light on this uh, uh, first to start with, and then we'll move on to the challenges. So uh, let me uh, kindly uh, request Dr. A.P. Jairaman to please give his opening remarks. Dr. Jairaman, over to you, sir. Uh, you're not audible, sir. You're on mute. Kindly unmute, and then you'll be very audible. Uh, Dr. Jairaman, yes. Uh, am I you're audible? audible Please go on. Yeah. Yes, you are very audible and visible. Please go on, sir. Visible too, yes. 
Thank you, Dr. Suman, for those wonderful words. It is always uh, pleasant to hear compliments, pleasanter still when it comes from a professor of your eminence. First, my salutations to Indian Merchants Chamber and its respected president, uh, Sri Rajiv Padar, and to the movers and shakers of MIT, WPAU for organizing this topical discussion meet. At midday, the topic on the anvil for us to hammer out is opportunities and challenges for sustainable research and development initiatives. Yes, I understood the dimensions to which Dr. Suman has invited us. And uh, as a professional scientist, we are a bit like a grammarians, grammarians finding fault in love letters. That's the business of grammarians and professional scientists also do that. When I was looking at the anatomy and physiology of the topic given for discussion, I find the research and development initiatives, sustainable research and development initiatives. Then I had a doubt in my mind. Are we speaking about sustainable research and development initiatives or are we speaking about research and development uh, initiatives for sustainable development? Now, if I am a professor, obtaining a PhD at the age of 27 or 28, and leading a life cycle of 30 to 35 years in the career, I can have a sustainable R&D initiative career all through my life. It's pretty easy because R&D, I can start with a small and R and a small D. I can go into a capital R and a small D. I can go into a capital R and a capital D and various formulation, permutations and combinations that possible and keeping my professional life, my adjunct professor's life, my assistant professor's, every professor's life in life cycle can be managed by sustainable R&D initiatives. Therefore, I presume that what we are trying to do now is to application of R&D initiatives for sustainable development. Assuming that this would be our prerogative, I feel that sustainability is a word most widely cited in literature, but probably used and abused and misused. If you look at the technical literature, you will find no less than 200 plus definitions of sustainability. And if you look at the more cited ones by the professional bodies, you will find six of them in great detail. For example, the five most cited sustainability defin development definitions are that by the American Institute of uh, Certified Purchasing Accountants, whose emphasis was on the economy aspect of it. Then we have the International Integrated Reporting Council with its emphasis on documenting what sustainability work we have done. Of course, we have the definition from Harvard Business Review, which asks us to integrate this into your economy. And we have the, the GRI, the Global Reporting Initiative. And finally, we have the most quoted and the widely quoted one, the Butland definition of United Nations. That is sustainable development is that development which ensures the functionality of the present without affecting those of the future generations. That great definition coined, framed and minted out, including by the Indian jurisprudent expert, Singh, and by Butterell, Butter, uh, that's, that's what we call the Butland definition. Uh, how far is it successful as a guideline for R&D initiatives? That is the technical question which we would like to ask. Now, when Butland definition of sustainable development is given, it is meant for generations to come. How many generations? My next generation or my grandchildren's generation or beyond that? And what is the multiplication factor? 8 billion? 16 billion, 24 billion. So those are the issues which come with uh, this type of uh, definitions. But they are the guidelines for policymakers, perfectly fine, but they are not the ground rules or selection rules which enable a professor in the laboratory choose the, report, the, the initiative. For example, in 1964, when I was uh, studying for the Baba Atomic Energy Training School, where we have the mix of engineering and science, and we are graduating from that, the, Research and development ecosystem was designed, developed, and deployed by Dr. Homi Baba in such a way that when we come out of the training school, we were able to position ourselves in places where we could do research and development tailored to the needs of the establishment which we were coming. So what I want to submit is, since the three pillars of sustainability are known to be environment, economy, and society, at the moment we find uh, 
overall a sort of a Mickey Mouse model with the economy in the center, with the small circles of environment and uh, equitability on the other side. This model will change substantially if we go into sustainable engineering. And sustainable engineering would be the ideal guiding principle for R&D developments now because the World Federation of Engineering Organizations, a representative body of 30 million engineers across the world, have defined what uh, sustainable engineering is. And it, the, we also have now the Martin Polyakov's rule and uh, where we are told, we are told, in fact, most of the chemical engineering people in the field, they are using the project design rules for R&D, for sustainable R&D developments. And also we have uh, one of the more fundamental survival toolkits, a periodic table of 90 checklists available for every research guide to find out whether the for problem is formulated and frozen is incompatible with the sustainable development goals. That is the larger research scenario available to us. If, when I get my time, I would like to apply to two areas, sustainable development goals, that 17 goals, which is uppermost in our mind, out of which sustainment goal number six, which is on water, and the impact of water and wastewater treatment, and particularly the desalination technologies available, and what are the sustainable rankings for these desalination technologies, and which are the areas where we can do R&D initiatives with respect to applicability of those chosen, selected, technically major desalination technologies to the Indian conditions. That is one aspect. SDG 6, I would like to say if I get time. And SDG 12 is another area where the electronic waste management is the chemical engineering aspects where professors can take up small projects which will have direct immediate relevance for the project. So these are two areas of desalination technology. It's technical maturity, applicability in the rural conditions in this country, and also the research and development initiatives for sustainability of strategic critical materials involved in the electric waste industry. That's my submission, please. Thank you. Thank you for your opening remarks, uh, Dr. Uh, APJ Raman. And thank you for bringing in the concept of sustainability. And uh, we would also be uh, interested in discussing the efforts, uh, the CSR efforts of the industry particularly, uh, which largely fall in the domain of uh, social responsibility vis-a-vis -vis also uh, focusing on the economic sustainability of the businesses. Now, I would request uh, Dr. Kanodia to give his opening remarks uh, for the session. Over to you, Dr. Kanodia. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Rajiv Podaji, fellow panelists, faculty of MIT, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I believe as per the schedule, I have just about five minutes for my opening remarks, so I'll try and be as brief as I can. And I can, I shall draw upon my experience in the USA, and particularly my days at uh, MIT, uh, the other MIT, uh, other than the one that we are addressing today. I'd like to start off by saying that the total R&D spend across all countries in the world is estimated today at $2 trillion, which is approximately 2.5% of the world GDP. In contrast, India spends 0.6% of its GDP on R&D. So you can see we do have a huge problem in front of us, which we need to, to address. Let me point out some interesting statistics. The four most developed countries with the largest GDP in the world today are the USA, China, Japan, and Germany. It's no surprise that these are the countries that have the largest R&D spend in the world. The USA spends $476 billion, China $370 billion, Japan $170 billion, and Germany $109 billion. So you can see there's a direct correlation between R&D spend and the welfare and the well-being and the GDP of a country. 
I would also like to point out that there is a dichotomy, there's a distinction between R and D, though they're all called R and D. The R is quite different from D, in my opinion. Uh, R can be blue sky research, something which Isaac Newton did or Einstein did. Uh, and development is the development of, it can be polymers, it can be chemicals, it can be vehicles, it can be phones. So the development is quite different from pure research. Now, if you see the USA and you see most countries of the world, the R component, the research component, is by and large comes out of universities. Uh, no wonder, example, uh, MIT has produced 85 Nobel laureates. That speaks for itself. The person who won two Nobel laureates, Linus Pauling, uh, the only four people who won more, two uh, Nobel prizes, one of which is Linus Pauling, was a professor at Caltech and Stanford. So you can see the R component by and large comes out of the university system in almost every single country. Now, if you look at the American system of, of in the university, the professors are mandated to do four things. They have some mandated to do research. They're mandated to publish, teach, and then finally consult. This is a part of their job profile. Now, I happen to be on the advisory board of Bombay University, which has seven and a half life students. Dr. Ariel Kakorka is one of the other members. Ratan Tata is another member. And I told them, including the Vice Chancellor, Dr. Petnikar, that we need to mandate our professors to do research and to publish. And the answer was staggering. And they do a lot of teaching. The maximum number of hours are devoted to teaching. And the answer was that our budgets don't allow it. We have to increase the load on teaching. And therefore, there's almost no research done out of the colleges. So if that is the situation, I don't know how we are going to get into the research component of it. Companies will not do research. Blue sky research, as we know it, has to come from the think tanks at the universities. Like Einstein was a professor at Princeton, for example. Even all of the great research comes out of people who are in the university system. Incidentally, uh, though Einstein only got one Nobel Prize, uh, experts tell me that he should have got seven Nobel Prizes. He got it for the photoelectric effect. He did not get it for the equation E equal to MC squared, to give you an example. The fact of the matter is this kind of a research can only come out of that environment. At MIT, where I was there for many years, it was electrifying. And the entire pressure is on research. Now, they, I don't see any pressure. So I've been a student at IIT Bombay. Uh, there is no such pressure in our Indian university system. But that's my humble submission. Now, let's come to development. See, the old method of running an industry or becoming a businessman was based on you start a joint venture with an American British company or other company, you collaborate with them, and then you produce what you want. And the license raj was a deterrent to do any development. This fortunately has changed. Uh, you can see yesterday we had Mr. Dave talking about the, the smaller version of the um, vehicle, the uh, goods carrier, which he did research. And then, of course, Mahindra's have done that also with the Scorpio. Uh, Tata's built the Nano, which very, very, I'm very sad that it failed in a commercial sense. But that is a part of development. Now, development is very important uh, if the industry is going to get forward and to become world leaders. Everything develops. A car becomes better and better and better. A, a plane becomes better and better and better and so on. So by and large, the development part of it is driven by business and industry. And there's very little pressure in India on business industry to spend their money on development. So somehow we have to get into a situation where we you know, encourage them, pressurize them to spend more of the budgets on the development part of of, of the business. Now, Indians are very talented. I don't have to tell this audience that. 
Today, the high-tech companies, IBM, Google, Microsoft, all headed by Intel. So we don't like talent. Given the opportunity, we are world leaders without any question. Also, if you really want to get up there, and India also aspires to become one of the largest economies in the world, you've got to develop things that didn't exist. I'm not talking research, I'm talking development. Example, the Xerox process. Example, the smartphone. Example, the personal computer. And so on and so forth. So this must come out of business and industry. And there's going to be pressure on them to spend their dollars and to earn rewards on the basis of the development work they do. And therefore our IP protection laws also need to be looked at very carefully. So ultimately, if you develop something and then it's stolen, then you've lost that money. So the IP part of it is something which I think the government needs to, to look at very, very carefully. I don't have to tell this audience that today the driver of economic development and progress is no longer land, labor, or capital, it's knowledge. You can see all the companies that have the highest market cap are all knowledge driven. So therefore it's very important for us to invest in knowledge, which is really our ND. It's, it's, it's so very critical. Now, India has been the hotbed of R&D and education. Look at Taksila, Nalanda. Look at old scientists, including Aryabhat. We have so much to be proud of that we are a nation that can talk about this which no other nation in the world can. So I think it's very important to somehow focus R for the universities, D for business and industry. The other point I'd like to make before I end is that the, the great things come out of smaller places. Very large companies don't do that very well. If you look at all the development efforts worldwide, you'll find they all emanate from small people, small enterprises, and so on. Uh, one example is Xerox. Xerox was invented by Dr. Carlson. And Carlson couldn't sell it. So Carlson had to then, after 15, 20 years, sold his patent Xerox company, which then, of course, made Xerox world famous. So I think we need to look at how do we encourage the MSME sector to do R&D, to develop things, and to somehow monetize their efforts. So I think we, we Indians are extremely talented. We have an immense opportunity. Uh, we have a huge market. Uh, we are recognized worldwide for many, many reasons. And I think this is the right time. And I'm delighted that IMC now taken the initiative with MIT to, to focus on R&D, which I think holds the future for our development, our growth of GDP, and our growth of per capita income, which is the need of the hour. So with these opening remarks, uh, I'll conclude my address and I look forward to any questions and answers, Well, I'll be more than happy to participate. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Devadullah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kanodia, for your opening remarks. Indeed, uh, we have speakers uh, mentioning about the very less amount of expenditure that India makes in research. I would want to add on to this that around 80% of the domestic R&D is taken up by the public sector in India. And out of this, uh, I mean, in fact, in private enterprises only spend 20% and 3% uh, by the universities. Now compare this with private universities uh, and universities in uh, the OECD countries. 69% is spent by private enterprises and 18% by universities and only 10% by the government in OECD countries. And even non-profit organizations spend 3% in the OECD countries. So uh, I'm quoting uh, uh, Patil and Biswas uh, on their report uh, on 2014. Now from 2014 to 2020, the research spend has come down from 0.9 to 0.6 as you rightly mentioned. Uh, but we need to really ramp up the expenditure across uh, the MSME sector also, as you have very rightly pointed out. So moving forward, I would like uh, Ms. Nidhi Raina to please give her opening remarks uh, for this session. Over to you, Ms. Nidhi. Thank you, Suman. I really appreciate it. Foremost, um, I appreciate uh, everyone being here and having me and like they say, you know, um, the five people that you surround yourself with and which is your life. And I think for the next hour, my life is going to be very enriched. I had 
um, a good time listening to um, such lovely and prestigious people here, prestigious and esteemed people here. And um, I think most of what I wanted to say in the opening address did get covered. Um, so I thought I'll make a few notes and um, probably take the other side of uh, the spectrum to say, what is the context within which innovation and research and development should happen? And I think pretty much everybody knows that. However, for the, for the next 30, 40 minutes that we discuss this, I think the 100 participants do need to have um, you know, a reminder of the larger principles around which we as a family or as a country or as a nation or as a larger world move towards it going forward. We've had our own evolution as a planet, as, as countries and as people, and therefore the decisions we've taken so far have led us to a certain direction. But does that direction now need to be, does it need to be a progressive evolution or can we do as uh, as the next generation and a disruptive one and disruptive in a good sense, you know, like how a, a caterpillar disrupts the cocoon and becomes a butterfly. I think uh, four principles that I wrote down really quickly that I feel um, might add some perspective to the conversation was number one, allopathy versus Ayurveda, right? So. Uh, one element of research and development is the idea that everything should be put in a box and studied. And that's good, right? Because allopathy has got as huge res results in terms of how we think of the heart and the lungs and everything else. But there is another perspective, which is Ayurveda, which says everything works in union. And somehow when we look at research and development in the future, I think we as a country uh, and as principles that we take forward, as the founding principles of how we just do research and development, has to be a lot more collaborative and has to have a higher understanding of how those, it's okay that we box them together, but don't forget that they all work together and there is a connection and therefore a huge degree of collaboration that is the bottom or the underlying principle of whatever research and development we take forward with so that we are not skewed in our understanding and we have a, a progressive way of getting the whole body to, to develop as opposed to just one organ becoming better, maybe sometimes at the cost of the other. So that's one principle that I think um, would become, would be a great one to have. Another, uh, another remnant of a principle like that would become the idea of sustainability. To me, the idea of sustainability is a very boxed version of it. I don't have to think about how do I sustain my balcony, my kitchen, uh, my bedroom. Why? Because I don't think of them as different parts of the same house. When you think of research and development, HR, administration, finance as different aspects that have to be managed somehow, then comes the idea that somebody in the uh, in the country has to take care of this, the industry has to take care of this, somebody has to do some SR, CSR, somebody has to have a role in, to play, which in my view is a very allopathic way of looking at things. It's needed, a structure is needed, and so is the flow. So when you're looking at sustainability, it has to be thought from the perspective of integration, an integrated manner of looking at things, not as a boxed manner, and then somebody has to put an extra effort to make sure that it stays, the narrative stays, the voice stays, the, the policy that we're trying to change stays. Um, that, of course, stems from an actual cultural behavioral um, development, which I believe India, not just India, the whole world is lacking on. Technology is far preceding the mindset or the behavioral development of individuals who are supposed to uh, control it. So that's one element uh, or one principle that takes care of so many other things. The other second thing uh, principle that I wanted to put on the table for consideration is that whatever research and development we do has to have people at the center of it. Research for the sake of research is in my opinion useless. You can go into uh, the depths of how say we work and why we think, et cetera, which is great. But if it doesn't come back and add value, uh, significant value to how we, the inhabitants of the people, the ones who are the emanation point of all this thought, is actually evolving us to the next level of thought and not just getting lost in the color drum of what could be and having those conversations till the end of the world. So is that research really helping people grow? If it's helping technology grow, it's great, but uh, you know we can do better, right? Um, third thing was the multi-dimensional multi nature of truth, the spherical nature of truth. We have uh, one of the reasons why we as a race or the, or the world are lacking because if U.S. says this is the way we need to look at things, we tend to pretty much look at things the same way. We've in that process killed alternative medicines, we've killed an alternative understanding of things because 
they have not been scientifically validated. And so as we as a country or as a nation, or if we become the pioneers tomorrow, uh, you know, we wish, we need to have a perspective that has a better collaborative, contributive, not whose role is it to do what, but who's contributing to it. How can you contribute, not what's your role in it? So how can we have an understanding of the truth that allows you to look at the outcome in multiple ways, as opposed to saying, here's the person, he did the right thing. And so if Einstein said, relatively, relativity is the best, and now for ages, it's not questioned because everybody wants to take the leap up after that, instead of debating whether that really stands true or not. So as people, as the 107 participants here, make sure that the foundations on which you're building the research and development have been something that you personally have in some way experienced, embedded, or, or, or found a way to found it true for you because every individual's mind or contribution is unique. And that's really how we we'll do um, immense innovation as opposed to just on the shoulders of others. And the fourth thing that I'd like to leave uh, with, uh, you know, is the means do not justify the end. It's great that we're we are doing research and we're doing development, but if it, as it is at the cost of doing things that um, are just cutting edge for the sake of cutting edge, they will hit um, a wall, right? Whether it is in your generation or the next. Say, for example, cloning. Say, for example, the whole COVID mess that we are in is from a research that really, I, I don't know how it was supposed to help humans grow or evolve or, um, um, or become better, right? Or they probably didn't know. Same with AI, right? We're still hitting the point where technology is now a consideration, not because of what it can do, but because it's now at the borderline of what is moral and principle yeah, and what yeah. is right for humans versus humans. So um, those, I think those four principles, uh, first is a holistic approach. Second is people at the center of whatever you do, people growth and evolution at the center of whatever you do. Third is multidimensional nature of whatever truth you are trying to uncover with it. And fourth is make sure that the process and the outcome justify what you're doing uh, in this process. Um, and th thank you for those five minutes. Yeah. Over to you, Simon. Thank you. Thank you, Nidhi, for uh, laying out those four principles. Uh, you actually opened up a host of areas for research, uh, particularly with the first principle, when you speak about the comparative research in allopathy versus Ayurveda, we're definitely looking at a lot. And we recently had a distinguished speaker speaking on transdisciplinary medicine, integrative medicine, which considers a lot of uh, uh, behavioral uh, uh, approaches of people who actually seek not just one form of medicine, but several other forms of medicine also in their curative, uh, uh, in their uh, endeavor to cure themselves. So this is indeed a very important and opens up a lot of research areas. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, that's also what we're doing with Conscious. Conscious is really providing conscious life as a service to the customers. That includes behavioral growth, as well as healthy, uh, conscious living, conscious thinking, and a conscious life. So uh, that is in very much in line. Anything else I can help there would be wonderful too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, would you also like to point out as what conscious is rather than conscious? Sorry, it is. Um, I'm still getting used to it, but conscious really is quantum conscious, which really means how do we okay. take mega strides towards having a conscious planet? Great, great. Thank you for your opening remarks, Nidhi. Uh, your principles, as I've mentioned, are very uh, uh, fundamental in uh, thinking about research. The people-centric research, which you also highlighted, is very important in uh, design, uh, which is very close to me. Uh, otherwise, I'm uh, uh, likening this with what Dr. Kanodia has pointed out in terms of uh, blue sky research should be the pursuit of academia and irrespective of uh, how it is developed, which is the uh, which is the uh, approach should be taken by the industry. So moving forward, uh, I would love, like to uh, uh, ask uh, Dr. Jairaman to put up his uh, emphasis on what he thinks is the R&D infrastructure in India, particularly with respect to the Sustainable Development Goals 6 and 12. Dr. Jairaman, over to you, sir. Thank you. My humble submission is 
the people centric aspect has been well managed by the united nations 17 sustainable development goals because in that they have stated that the 17 goals are integrated together that brings us a lot of uh, direction and velocity in the direction magnitude of the velocity with respect to our research programs if we want to with our uh, human development index today hovering at a very low figure it is very necessary that we should concentrate our research and development on sustainable development goals and in the sustainable development goals if you put seven in the center that is sdg7 is the energy component all the other 16 can be brought about it but it is impossible for industries and professors to work on the energy aspect and to bring about a deliverable product i am reminded of the formula of dr anil kakodkar who replaced r and d by rb3 research development, demonstration, and deployment. This makes a big difference because you can always do research, you can also do development, but demonstration by the people who did not do the research, give the pilot plan project to somebody else who has to do it. So this sort of uh, development until it is deployed. I will give you a very case study where I did a work on reverse osmosis. Our objective under the sustainment development goal six, now it is under SDG six, is to give water to a village, a village of about 200 people. Now, to give, a village, to give water to people in a village, we have several technologies available. And if you look at the technology spectrum, you'll find the desalination technologies. You can have the membrane processes. You, oh, there are two membrane processes, reverse osmosis and electrodialysis. You have three thermal processes, multi-stage flash, multi flash distillation, multiple effect distillation, and vapor compression. Of this, you have to make a technology choice. The technology TV, technology vision 2035 document prepared by Anil Kokotkar Commission gives you exact guidelines what research we should take and what research we should avoid for the future. For example, there is a technical maturity level now available for the research scientists. If you want to know where do we stand with respect to, say for example, in the case of water, we want to think of doing a research work under SDG 6 of using the water in the pipeline. As the water flows through the pipeline, there should be a filtration system that is the point of use, this should be available in the pure portable safe drinking water. That is available. But if you look at the technical maturity of that research project, you will find that this is at level two. Now, when we say level two, there is a proof of concept, there is further research required, something is in the laboratory is willing to come out and something is ready. So you need a differentiation of the maturity classification for a technology. And you should have the felt need of yours there. You match the two, and then you will have a more meaningful, people-centered, deliverable product. That's one aspect. Much more work has been done, particularly by Martin Polyakov and so on. All the conundrum, the complexity and the confusion and the indeterminateness of the diversity of projects being coming up, there are now a periodic table of priorities available. 90 conflicting parameters have been brought together and every researcher can go to that and find out where does the sustainability and compatibility comes in with respect to his project. What I'm trying to submit is the tools and the survival engineering tools are now available. And the most important one, particularly if we come to, let, let's say, uh, come back to water again. Now, water and wastewater treatment is something which is under so SDG 6. We have, uh, say, brackish water. Now, for to supply water to, say, 200 people in a village, let us have, we don't have to DuPont uh, Polyamide membranes don't have to be used. You can have indigenous membranes. So local universities should work on cellulose acetate membranes to convert brackish water with the pupil, with the concentration of, let's say, 5,000 to 6,000 parts per uh, total dissolved salts. That can be very well solved with a cellulose acetate membrane under with the polycarbonate uh, shell structure. But the deployability, the people centricness comes here. For example, when I refer to one work under the technology mission where we were delivering this water from a reverse osmosis system, it was found out that the people were not, uh, at first they were very happy and they were drinking the water. After about seven days, we found that there was a rejection of the water. They were very allergic. We don't want this uh, chemically treated water. Because we were adding, as, as our research pointed out, a small quantity of acid to the input water, the input water which we collect from the local water, brackish water wells, 
add a little acid to preserve the integrity and the long life of our membrane. When the when we bought this battery water battery acid from a battery store locally, the news spread that acid has been bought and is being added to the water. This is a sterilization principle being used, and there was a boycott of water. So technology can improve, but there can be cultural shock when the product is being delivered. So we have to take the people into confidence when a technology is being developed, demonstrated, and deployed. So that is one particular aspect as far as uh, technology is concerned. And uh, my own submission is technologies, are, the wide spectrum of technologies are available at different maturity levels. What is needed is a judicious and discrete choice of technologies and apply the appropriate quantum of research and development, either directed research or applied research at the university or in the industry to bring it to the deliverable stage. So it is not, the, of course, there is scope for a blue, blue sky research, for example, hydrogen fuel, we may need to do a blue sky research, or for example, uh, there are several areas for blue sky research. But since SDGs have been defined, and since sustainability has to be built into that, and sustainable engineering has now come of age, it is possible for us to deliver all the sustainable development goals within the framework of the United Nations by, by conscious, deliberate application of, tech, of research and development initiatives. Thank you for your remarks, uh, Dr. Jayaraman. And thank you for also pointing out at the opportunities in terms of technologies that are available that local uh, universities can uh, uh, use, particularly in terms of making those membranes for the water purification, as well as not neglecting involvement of people so that it is accepted eventually rather than being uh, rejected even in its development uh, uh, stages. Now, uh, I would like uh, to request uh, Dr. Panodia to address a particular question which is of interest to this session, as well as on the ongoing discussion, my question is, uh, uh, given that we are spending so much less in India on R&D, and most of that goes to the public institutes, now what should be the emphasis of our private universities? What measures uh, should private universities take so that they leverage and attract investments uh, for uh, sustaining research programs, even initiating research programs, forget sustaining them? We are looking at a state wherein a significant amount of research uh, money goes to the IITs, IASCs, et cetera, and much less to private institutions. So your uh, inputs on this, uh, please, Dr. Kanodia. Well, during my discussion as a member of the advisory board of Bombay University, I was told that the ratio of students to faculty in India is twice what it should be, which was a bit of a surprise to me. And therefore, as a consequence of that, there's immense pressure on the faculty to increase the number of lectures and the amount spent on teaching. And there's all virtually no pressure on them to spend money on research and publication. Also, if you see, I, I, I'm sure there are exceptions, but the, the pressure on promotions, like in America, example, there's pressure that if you do not do research and you do not publish, you do not get what is called tenure. And if you do not get tenure, you have to, in effect, resign from the university. Now, this is something which I don't think India can ever even think of for, for many reasons, some of which are social in nature. Yeah. But the fact of the matter is that unless there's some pressure on the faculty to research, why would they do research? Uh, I, you'd be surprised, in my laboratory at MIT, uh, I used to work all night for whatever reason, I was highly motivated. Half the lab was full of professors at midnight. You will not believe it, at midnight. And you know, this came out of motivation and the, that desire to do something. I don't see this energy level Though I've been a student at IIT Bombay, is extremely good, let me tell you. But I don't see that level of uh, motivation that is there in our faculty. And part of it is because of the fact that there's too much pressure on teaching. And there's no pressure on research and publishing in terms of promotion. So we have to change the reward system uh, if we are going to achieve this. So this is something which, uh, and that's not going to be easy to do. Yeah. Thank you for those uh, suggestions, uh, Dr. Kanodia. 
We definitely are looking at uh, the other side of demographic dividend, looks like. Uh, we are a huge uh, socialist republic, so from that perspective, to be able to teach to all these uh, uh, burgeoning populations, uh, the ratios even uh, speak of that. On another note, uh, I also want to hear from you as to what uh, do you think about the progressive initiatives uh, that the government of India has been taking, like Make in India, Startup India, Digital India. What do you think is the role of industries and academic institutions to play in this, Dr. Kanodia? Well, in, in principle, what the Prime Minister is saying, I think is absolutely right. Atman Nirbhar Hindustan. We, as a nation, we are a large nation, 130 crore people. We have to become self-dependent. There is no doubt about that. In terms of principle, he is right. Uh, how do we accomplish that is a more complex issue. Uh, one of the points that I keep writing to the Prime Minister as President of an association or even otherwise, See, India has, the government currently, in my opinion, has two big problems. One is there's no economist of any stature that is guiding the government what to do. And we are therefore paying a price for that. The other point, if you see, if you see the cabinet uh, of India, how many businessmen are there? You will understand how to develop the economy. They're absent. Maybe one Nitin Gadkari a little bit and a Piyush Goel a little bit, but there's nothing of that nature in the government. So I think the government needs to somehow understand the fact that we the world has changed. We need people who understand domain. You look at the German cabinet. I would encourage you to do that. They're all specialists in the field, and most of them have PhDs, by the way. The yeah, fact of the matter is we still follow the old system where we put anybody in any chair and assume that he will deliver. We don't recognize the fact that you need the experience, you need knowledge, you need domain experience to be able to, to deliver. So I think what the Prime Minister is saying is absolutely right. But I don't think he has the manpower available to him, whether the bureaucrats or whether the politicians, to be able to deliver on his ideas. Now that's a different ballgame. So I, I think he has a challenge right now. And that is reflected in the slowdown of the economy, even prior to COVID. COVID has had a tremendous impact, but if you see one or two years, even before that, it has had an impact. I think we need to somehow change our system with the bureaucracy changes, the politician change, and we work towards an objective. And that is not uh, going to be an easy job. It's a very tough job, in my opinion. Okay. Okay, uh, I would like to take uh, the view of uh, Ms. Nidhi Raina on this, uh, on the same question. Um, I had um, a few things that I thought that we can do. I think uh, relying on the government is probably, uh, you know, for, for, for a different way, old school now. I think we've relied on them and I think they've delivered as much that they can do, but they're in an environment that probably isn't best suited for the kind of innovations that we as a country need given the scale the culture and everywhere that we come from and history of different types of uh, colonizations and other things that are now part of our DNA. What I've seen, however, in, in my view is that industries and, and people like um, Mr. Kanodia, Mr. Kandara, I think they have changed the, the nation far more than the government has been able to do. And now with country, with, with folks with flip card, et cetera, how they're changing the way of e-retail, there is a huge opportunity for industries and also for the startups because every, every industry was a startup at some point and they all did whatever they could within the government to make that happen. Yes, the government has given us the strength to really ask them because they have done our expectations are ex exceeding what probably was available to people 20 years, 50 years down the line when these companies have been built and sustained. Um, I think we need to, as um, as you, as you uh, co-creators co of the next future of the country, look at how each element of it can contribute and how each of those can be made to blossom on their own, um, you know, to start with within the, the, the reservations because uh, individually, no one person can lift, you know, the the entire web uh, of lack of innovation that we as a country are facing right now. So, uh, I think for startups, I had three things there that said you need to have better incubation cells, and we need to have them standardized and measured for results, even if they are in colleges, wherever else. Currently, we're just relying on the funding that the government is giving to deliver something, and uh, there isn't much 
no way to really understand whether those incubations and accelerators are really working. Two, we need to start at a much younger age. You cannot rely on people who have been built with the thought that a job is safe to come out of college and then automatically just think that we need to start a company. It has to happen uh, by say class six, eight, where they start starting to sell candies or on different on Halloween days or something. Uh, start building their image, start understanding the idea of finance, of philosophy, of psychology, consumer mindset, centricity, all that has to happen at a lot younger age. And the third thing is we need to create huge awareness. Uh, uh, sometimes you can push things, but uh, it's a lot easier if you have a pull. Our media, our institutions, we should take significant pride and even in the smallest of innovations that are coming from our schools, colleges, whatever it may be, and um, you know, possibly blow them out like in America does with its marketing to create a pull for the rest of those who are still under their cocoon. Uh, those are the three things I had for startups. Uh, so thank you for asking. Yeah, thank you, uh, Nidhi, for bringing up the perspective of startups and uh, how early that thinking needs to chip in in terms of the efforts of the uh, management. So uh, further, uh, I would uh, ask you, uh, ask the panel about what measures the government should take to make R&D sustainable in India. And I'm talking about research, blue sky research or even uh, product-based research, particularly from uh, emphasizing the opportunities that India as a nation has. I just want to highlight some opportunities that I've listed uh, so that uh, it might be of help in uh, the panel members recommending what measures the government could take. So uh, I'm just thinking out loud now. So we are a largest democracy. Uh, we, the geographic, geographical position of India uh, allows for a service model in terms of uh, around the clock work. Uh, and we are also looking at a diversity of market, not just market size, but diversity of markets. And we're also looking at a very young population. And these would also be young for the next 10 years, right? So, and this population is also about a lot of English speaking uh, population rather than just about uh, anybody. And we're also talking about uh, uh, s some strengths and opportunities uh, like these that India has. So what can be the, uh, the, what challenges can be actually be addressed in terms of measures that the government could take uh, to make R&D sustainable uh, across uh, research? I want to hear Dr. Jairaman's opinion first on this. What are the measures that government should take to make R&D sustainable in India? Thank you very much for this uh, question, but it is uh, very complex. This has been engaging the minds of the bright uh, engineers of this country. There is the Kalam model, there is the Kakotkar model, and today we have the Kasturi Rangan model of education. The three engineers have given their views. My point is, the first we started with uh, P, who, the Pura technology of uh, Kalam, that is providing urban amenities to rural areas. That is how we started. So we must understand that 4% of the matter is known, but 96% of the matter is dark matter. We have no knowledge about it. Similarly, we were speaking about the mainstream English-speaking college students and school students coming from it. But we have a rural India where there, which is an entirely different. Therefore, integrated rural technology centers or the Kakotkar concept called the silage, application of production, of cities and villages, application of technologies, appropriate technologies, relevant, relevant technology in the rural sector is the vital function today, for which the technological understanding is available. No new technology need to be produced to bring a certain standard of living or a certain standard of life. That is one assumption. Now, that assumption itself is uh, quite axiomatic. They're not be thinking of it. If you want to produce uh, the George Maslow's uh, fundamental level of physiological existence or the security level, that much technology is currently available in different isolated, disconnected pockets. That is why there should be a people science movement across the country, along with the governmental initiative, to bring the technologies to those practices. So if we have a, see, for example, we say that's a knowledge economy. The strength of a knowledge economy definitely, uh, as pointed out here, depends on the science workers. But actually, you will find a stronger and a more confidence level correlation between the number of PhDs in engineering and technology with respect to your GDP. A knowledge economy is primary. The single critical variable for the development of a technology civilization is the number of PhD engineering holders. So engineering application to rural, for example, the Jetroka 
project which uh, which uh, kalam was speaking so we must find out what are the requirements that is resource mapping at the village level the fourth world where decentralization should take place the, an applied gandhian economics model is an ecological model that is village should be self sufficient and technology is available should be applied over here rather than looking at very energy intensive material intensive technology for example the moment we say speak about research what we do is take some material give energy to that the moment you take a material and the moment you apply energy to that as the input you get an output but the desirability and the utilizability of that project depends upon the end users so we have a large rural population today. and my submission is we have appropriately mature technology available application has not been done so it should be the social responsibility or the heightened consciousness of this and of the engineering community to take this available technologies to the rural place and make appropriate changes like the membrane i meant earlier so that their felt needs are met government effort supplemented engineered and fabricated equally well by a people's engineering movement that's what we should look up to uh, thank you thank you dr jayraman uh, for connecting the uh, wealth of knowledge in engineering and design phds in india to the gdp of a nation to be something which uh, is suggested to be uh, sustained to be sustaining research and development in india i would now request uh, dr kanodia to uh, uh, put his remarks on uh, the measures that the government should take particularly from the context of the opportunities that india has as a young nation you mentioned about uh, the uh, faculty ratios uh, uh, in the iits and we have growing faculty ratios uh within the private university system uh, over the few sessions earlier they have been notes that there are a long a list of regulators who need to be abided by rather than uh giving a free hand to even decide on the curriculum and do research which is very much of use to the people but what particularly uh is of interest to me in this session is what measures should the government take to sustain r&d uh, initiatives in india focusing on the opportunities that india provides well let me answer this in terms of concept i think the government or any government for that matter has two distinct roles one of regulation and the other is one of promotion now right now example uh, there should be a tremendous amount of pressure on moving manufacturing from china into to india but this require promotion and not regulation we are not used to promoting so what is the consequence of that most of them have shifted already to vietnam or to indonesia despite the fact that america was at war with with vietnam they still prefer vietnam to india now is a question we should be asking why is that happening so the government needs to promote but the same bureaucrat no matter how bright he is cannot perform both the roles one of regulation and the other end of promotion i think you have to break those roles into two parts the other thing we have we wear colored glasses see we see all the big companies apple google even yahoo they all started as startups now 80 or 90% of the startups fail they go bankrupt and they are by and large funded by private equity funds who are willing to take that risk the banking system cannot take that risk it has to be private equity that takes the risk till recently there was something called angel tax so when private equity funded these startups 30% of it was taxed on its source which is ridiculous this recently sitaraman has removed that so these are absurd things that we do so i think there is certainly a role that the government has to encourage r and d and business the ease of doing business index in india is very low so you find that the government needs to change the way it looks at so this is all british system of regulation control uh, which has to change we've got to encourage people to do things we've got to encourage the msmes to grow 
you got to encourage business industry to to boom. Uh, we are over over emphasizing the control aspect of it. So I really hope that the government now, I think it sees it, but it is hamstrung with the past system which it cannot change very easily. If it if it somehow gets to be more positive, I'm sure our rate of growth will go go up. We are a very innovative nation. Uh, we from time immemorial have been entrepreneurial, and I think we want to do things. Uh, and by and large, under the British, for valid reasons, I think, there was more control built into the system, which needs to be discarded. One good example is IT. IT had no controls, zero. No licensing, no permission, no nothing. And we are now 55% of the world share of IT services from India. So you can see what it can do. So you want to liberate the Indian, you want to liberate the entrepreneur, you want to liberate the MSMEs. <laughs> If you do that, it will happen. Thank That's you for those permission. Thank you for those uh, enlightening words. Uh, in fact, indeed, uh, liberation at the academic level in terms of doing valid research as well as uh, letting businesses do business easily indeed uh, makes a lot of difference. I would like to take the opinion of uh, Ms. Nidhi Raina on this question, particularly on what measures do you think government should take to make R&D sustainable, emphasizing that India provides a lot of opportunity. I think, um, thanks, Suman. I think R&D is going to be an integrate nature of every startup. And running an own, my own company and looking for the right kind of partners, finding the right tribe to believe in what we're doing has been a little bit of a challenge ourselves, reaching out to people who are, uh, you know, uh, we are good, we're getting there as an entrepreneurial nation, and therefore looking at promoting research, right? What is, should research culminate into? It should culminate into application, right? Uh, so that's one thing where area where, there I, where I find, I don't know if governments can do something or not, but I definitely feel this is a gap, is that I know a lot of people, some of our own folks have, are part of some amazing research in the Antarctic region in terms of climate change, et cetera, but that's not really culminating into something. So you speak to them and they say, I don't know what they're going to do about the system, but we're doing it for them. And it's ending up in some archives. So that's one thing. Another thing we can do is give access, make research available across the world freely to everybody and make it possible. Um, so uh, like a Wikipedia of research is another thing that we're working with a few people on to make available is if we can look at steel and the tensile nature of steel and uh, try and understand how a spider can do that with his web. And that's how research is so open and uh, innovative, lateral thinking is encouraged. That's something that I feel not a lot of us in India as we are growing up are uh, allowed to do in that sense. We're not allowed to understand uh, grammar or geography from different ways, from whatever the way it is. You've got to rotate, figure it out and just follow that, follow that line. I think one thing that governments need to change is the education, the nature of education currently. Otherwise, our future is, uh, you know, it's going to be very tough to build an experimentation, exploration, be okay with it. Uh, the second thing is, as I said earlier, not let R&D be in silence. Uh, R&D is not the job of an R&D department. It is the, the department's job is to facilitate. It should not be to come up. So R&D people should be working with one in the industry, one in with different people across the world, one with groups of people who have absolutely nothing to do with the concept, but would come up with, you know, spider-like things for them to say, okay, have you considered this? So this idea that R&D should come from a research and development uh, at, uh, you know, faculty in a department or a research development center in a university is, or a lab, I think is overrated. We need to look at an integrated way of uh, approach, more like an agile version, where research is integrated, not just in the corporates and the universities, but also in human life. So as part of an employee's tenure, uh, in terms of before that person becomes, say, a project manager, a little bit of research and development of whatever they are doing, they should be part of already. And probably that's the way when people are on the ground working on something, they're more likely to come up with something innovative than, say, a department that's living in another side of the planet. Um, uh, that is one thing. And the other thing that I felt add on to uh, Mr. Kanodia, I was saying, and the amazing research you already do with uh, BRC that Jaramji was saying, is um, startups need to be supported. When I say startups, I don't mean uh, startups in the sense of started. Their innovation, research, experimentation, they, despite the psychology of the, of the country, if people in India are trying to figure something out, they need to be supported to the extent where not just incubation centers, 
But if somebody like Flipkart wants to sell, the uh, the company is looking for money. A lot of our unicorns right now are funded from outside our country. So what started as an Indian context and understanding of Indian data, culture, etc., lines up with 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 other countries, right? So where is uh, how are you supporting the entire cycle, or from a small child and the education to right up to when the startup wants to scale and become the pride of the nation? Uh, all that things have to be supported by the government and not just one thing. The third uh, element is pay. Our corporates don't pay our uh, PhD folks any better than I, uh, say, uh, what I was being paid, maybe a little bit here and there, but which normalized at the top, right? So how do you incentivize those people in, in the rural villages and doing a little bit of innovation, whether it is uh, you know, 3D pro, uh, pro um, uh, you know, fake arms and legs that they're making. How do you incentivize these guys? Can we figure out a way that corporates and everybody comes together to make those, uh, you know, make those people shine out, right? And that's, I think, where uh, Mr. Kenodia was making that point. We're not very good at promoting ourselves at all. And uh, I think we, we, as a country, have underplayed marketing significantly, and that's going to cost us a lot as we move towards a digital age where information is readily available and uh, people don't have the time to really dig into the details and understand who's the gem there. Uh, they're going to rely a lot more on uh, how that person is marketing themselves and how the department or their country is marketing themselves. So that's one area that I think the government should focus a lot on. Thanks Thank you. Thank you, Nidhi. We spoke a lot on opportunities and then... Uh... Uh, listening to Dr. Kanodia emphasizing on the lack of promotion that India as a country uh, does not do enough has actually led to a lot of business going to the Asian nations, the other Asian nations. So uh, and we will be progressing towards the concluding remarks. So I would want the panel members to take two minutes to give their concluding remarks, particularly that uh, from the perspective that uh, the challenges. We have focused a lot on opportunities and we've discussed opportunities in the context of R&D initiatives in India. Uh, kindly give your concluding remarks in two minutes, uh, emphasizing on what uh, the government needs to do or academic institutions need to do to face the challenges in sustaining R&D initiatives in India. I would request uh, Dr. Jairaman to give his uh, concluding remarks first. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I would uh, suggest that uh, we should weigh in very grudging scales the guidelines given for the sustainable engineering aspect. And if you do that, every project is weighed in the grudging scales of that 90 element document currently available. That will give us pretty good, pretty good direction and sense of direction. And the, la the last point is, uh, which uh, Rainaji was saying, and which I r would like to quote Albert Einstein himself, who wanted to be an engineer, but turned out to be a scientist. He said, concern for man and his fate must be the chief endeavor of all your technical activities. Never forget this in the midst of our equations and graphs. We produce equations, we produce graphs, we do excellent research in that, but we forget the human element in that. So application, conscious, deliberate application of available uh, literature with respect to sustainable development goals already available, apply the concepts, guidelines, and the imperatives, prerogatives of sustainability, and keep people, particularly the rural segment in the sector, and otherwise there will be lopsided development, and there will be orphan situations in the country where huge segments will be neglected, and inequity will prevail. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jairaman, for your concluding remarks. I would request to Dr. Kanodia to give his concluding remarks on this session. Please, Dr. Kanodia. Well, let me spend a minute on the education system. And I have three suggestions for the education system, which I think one should consider. One is that the, the best university, however defined, should not have reservation. See, the point is that if I'm teaching and I was teaching at MIT for one year, and if half your class are below average, then the level of teaching will automatically fall. So I think there's one thing that the, I know reservation is important. I think we need to uplift the people, but the best university, and I'm not talking of a large number, the concept of reservation should be eliminated in my opinion. 
The second is that the, the syllabus should not be left to the purview of the government in any way. Half the courses at MIT, when I was there, were not taught five years earlier. So the academia had the ability to change the syllabus as they wanted. And that is a very small university, by the way. MIT is only about 10,000 students. And it's rated as the best university in the world for many years. But this is what makes them very, very good. It's very important. The third point which I made earlier is that the, the method of rewarding the professor should be changed. But they're rewarded by other considerations, uh, not just by the teaching. Uh, in fact, there's a deterrent to consulting, by the way. Uh, if they consult, then a lot of that income is taken away by the college or the university, which is not correct. So we've got to change some of the very basic system if you're going to get to be among the best. There's none of our Indian universities, including the IITs, are rated in the top 100. So we need to change that. And unless we get that, and education is the backbone of any society. Uh, look at even Sri Lanka. Let me give an example of our neighbor. Education is free, by the way, at all levels. Look at China, look at the Scandinavian country, look at 